You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan White. Welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Before we put the car in gear, just a reminder, take a moment, go to iTunes, give us a rating, let us know what you think. Your thoughts are very important to us, and your feedback helps us make this show that much better. Today's topic is sports photography. John Harris and I will be talking with Gail Buckland, an author and or collaborator on 14 books on photography and photo history. Most recently, Who Shot Sports? A Photographic History, 1843 to the Present, and it's published by Alfred Knopf. It's an amazing book that goes way beyond splashy pictures of skiers and football players. It's about journalism. It's about advances in photographic concepts and technologies, pop culture, and world history. In her spare time, Gail is a distinguished professor of the history of photography at the Cooper Union. She's also the curator of Who Shot Sports, which is based on the book, and currently on view at the Brooklyn Museum. If you happen to be in New York City before January 2017, do yourself a favor and visit this incredible exhibition. We're also being joined by Andrew Bernstein, who's been shooting sports and sports figures for over 30 years. Andrew helped create NBA photos and became the league's first official photographer and senior director. Andrew's time with the NBA goes back to the Showtime era of Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And rumor has it that uh, some of the photographs of Kareem's skyhooks decorated John Harris's bedroom walls when he was growing up. I, uh, we're going to investigate that further. Andrew and his company are also uh, the official photographer to Los Angeles Lakers, Clippers, Kings, and Dodgers, and he has served as director of photography for Staples Center and Microsoft Theater in Los Angeles since opening day in 1999. In 2010, Andrew co-authored Journey to the Ring with Phil Jackson, documenting the Lakers' 2009-2010 championship season. Welcome, both of you. And we're going to start with Gail. Hi. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, guys. I really, really, really appreciate it's it. It's great. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I, I just want to get out up front is that I, we were talking a bit earlier. I'm not into sports. I really couldn't give a hoot about sports. However, the book that you have here, Gail, is phenomenal. I started going through it, and I realized it's not – sports is just the thread that holds the story together, but – it goes back through history, and it gives you a lot of interesting insights of what was going on in different times, how sports played into that, and also a lot about how photography has advanced because of sports itself. It's driven a lot of the technologies. And um, I, I just found it to be an amazing, amazing document that, again, shouldn't be limited just to sports. If you're interested in photography, it's a great, great book that I think will be making the rounds for a while. H how did you get into this? Well, thank you, Alan, for those compliments. <clears throat> um, I love photography. Like you, I'm not a sports fanatic. I'm a photo fanatic. I am passionate about photography. And I studied history and love taking pictures, but I really had to earn a living, and I combined my love of history with photography. And I tell my students, I'm still learning all the time by looking at photographs. Mm. And case in point, I have learned so much about cultural history, art history. Sports is, as you say, much more than who wins or loses the game. It's the human drama. Yeah. The Greeks knew it. They put their finest artists to depict the greatest athletes. I was just at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and on the great urns, you have the great mm -hmm. athletes mm -hmm. oh, yeah. depicted. Well, jump, flash forward, the mantle has been passed to photographers. They now give sports its image. And what is that image? Um, the press may publish certain photographs, but the photographers themselves, uh, Andrew included, they have many photographs that they've taken that describe much more than any one event. Um, people love sports, and the really great photographers make pictures that help explain why we're attracted to sports, why we love sports. We all walk around with our human bodies, but we recognize we can't do what our heroes do. 
but a sports photographer can encapsulate what it means to achieve greatness in many ways. And the response to Who Shot Sports has been so multifaceted because, yes, I do write about cultural history because sports is part of cultural history. I write some times about art history because artists have been looking at sports f- photographs since the time of my bridge. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I write about photographic history because sports photographers, more than any other group, have pushed camera technology. Andrew will probably address what cameras, what lenses, what he uses. He It's unbelievable how he uses the technology to give us images that we can't see with our naked eye. He puts cameras where we can't go. And this is also part of the story. Uh, I started in the 19th century. The earliest photograph was taken on a piece of writing paper that was sensitized with chemicals. Mm -hmm. Uh, 1843, the calotype process paper negative photography had only been invented two years before. Uh, our hero standing there with a racket for one or two minutes. He wasn't moving, right. but he had attitude because he wanted to use his body to express something physical. And I looked through all the photographs of this young man, Mr. Lan or Lang, and eight of them were the same. He's in a tie and jacket. He has a pile of books, his arm, his hand rests against his head to steady it. And then there's the one picture of him in a striped jersey holding a racket, and he comes alive. Uh Of course, it took me two days to find out what that racket was because the um, National Gallery of Edinburgh said it was a tennis racket. 1843, the game of tennis hadn't been invented yet. (laughs) It's royal and nobody tennis. told them. No, I told them after two <laughs> days of trying to track down every leading expert. Um, um, it was the game of kings. It was uh-huh. court tennis or uh, a real tennis. Yeah, the original tennis, yeah. Can you speak a little bit more about this and, and how long was the process from conception until until publication and even how when did you realize that it was going to be something more than just sports photography, something that was good, or was that always part of it? Yeah, that's a good question. I like to say that I worked on this project five years plus 40 mm-hmm. because <laughs> <Plus>. <laughs> I've, been, I've been researching the history of photography for a long time. I wrote the book on Fox Talbot and the invention of photography. I did the show at the Morgan Library. So I've done everything from Fox Talbot to sports. Mm-hmm. Um, once I decided to do this crazy thing, which my children said, oh, my God, Mom, you're going to make an idiot out of yourself. You don't know anything. Um, Usually when your kids tell you that, that's an incentive to move forward. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did, I, I did dedicate it to my two grandchildren and my son-in-law. I like that. that who was, was so yes. desperate <laughs> that I shouldn't make a fool of myself. He read everything mm-hmm. and corrected plenty of things. But... Um, I knew what I'm capable of doing. I can't write on sports. That's, that's a given. But I can write about photography. I can write about photography in the world. Most photographs are not just about what you think they're about. And my real compulsion has always been for 40 years to enlarge the canon. If you look at histories of photography, you never, ever see a sports photograph. I mean, they're just not included. Photography has these false hierarchies that certain subjects are more lofty, more artistic, and I really like breaking down those hierarchies because they're foolish. A great photograph is a great photograph no matter what the subject is. And my drive is to show respect and give dignity to men and women who have dedicated their lives to giving us some of the most exciting photographs that have ever been taken in the history of the medium. And that's why I did the book, because it needed to be done. Mm. 
Wow. So basically, it's a book about amazing photography and the, and the side stories. Coincidentally, they all happen to have something to do with sports. <laughs> well, <laughs> I I need to understand that sports is more than just the game. Yeah. It, and really great photographers do show us why people love sports. I, I think it is is unique in that... At the very heart of it is stopping the body in motion, Mm -hmm. um, communicating something very physical about us as human beings. And that's been part of art history from the beginning. And photographers do it so well, do it so very well. And we also catch the the slivers that Mm -hmm. visually, if you're just watching the occasion, you wouldn't see in many cases. There's a few photographs you have where, where they're, they're in the book that it's there are about a dozen faces facing the camera. I think it was a mm-hmm. soccer game or something. Everybody's expression is just so oh, unique. Oh, that's a great photo. You, mm-hmm. you, oh, could never, you could never see that. If you were at the event, you would not have seen it. No. Um, no, no, no. Still, photographers are masters of moments. No one does the moment better than a still photographer. And when we are speaking about sports, sports is very much about being in the moment. Mm -hmm. if you're the player, if you're the spectator, and if you're the photographer. So we can learn more about holding those moments because we do remember through still photographs, whether it's our family photographs, whether it's our kid's birthday or our birthday, we have this very powerful relationship with the still photograph. And again, that's why I did Who Shot Sports because... We watch sports on TV, and but mm-hmm. what really locks into our memory is the still photograph. Absolutely, yeah. I say the same about movies all the time too. When you think of your favorite movie, and what do you think of? Often you think of the still photo, not the, uh, you know, these moments of drama within. But uh, in the process of the book, when let's say dealing with the editor, or in the case of the show with with the museum. The photos by Warhol and Larry Fink and non-sports, let's call them. Were, was there any uh, any pushback against including this, or was that always part of it from the beginning? Each visionary, each artist brings something different to the mix. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very important for Andrew Bern- D. Bernstein to be in a book with Andy Warhol. Why not? Mm-hmm. And Larry Fink. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not that different. For decades, certain people have been called artists and other people have been called sports photographers and other people have been called, you know, baby photographers. Mm -hmm. But look at the pictures. It's much healthier to mix it up and let the photographs stand on their own. Photographs by Henry Cartier-Bresson, Robert Kappa, Danny Lyon, Walker Evans. You mentioned Edward Muybridge. Annie Leibovitz, Ernst Haas, who was one of my heroes when I started getting into photography, Stephen Wilkes, who's still on top of his game, Howard Schatz, ditto. Stanley Kubrick. (laughs) Stanley Kubrick, that's right, (laughs) filmic. George Silk, Harold Edgerton, Herb Britz, fashion photographer, Andy Warhol, Albert Watson, and Lewis Carroll. Yeah. I mean, these are the photographs, they're in this this sports photography book, and they're all sports photographs in various ways, and these are not sports photographers, No, but which is interesting. Even if I, I looked through um, W. Gene Smith's assignments before World War II, mm-hmm. and he was constantly being given girls' hockey game, mm-hmm. uh, running over to uh, people who shot for life and look. They did everything. Yeah. Yeah. The very first photograph that I found, day one, starting this project, Box one at the Getty Museum. They brought me out what they had related to sports. And I open up the box, and on the top of the box is a Walker Evans basketball picture. Uh-huh. <laughs> and I, I immediately saw what he saw, that in a photograph, all the action, all the tension has to take place within the frame. He sees the basketball court with those very rigid lines, and he realizes all the action, all the tension on that basketball court 
has to take place within those boundaries. Then the way the, the subjects are spread out. There's three white kids on one side, and then in the corner, there's somebody who looks Puerto Rican. And I say to the young girl who brought me the box, oh my God, you don't know if they're going to pick up a ball and play basketball or rumble. Right. <laughs> and she didn't know what I was talking about. And I said, "It's it was taken around the time of West Side, West Side Story. Story. Yeah. I was going to just say yeah. that. And she said, what? <laughs> and that's when you were asking me about cultural history. I mean, it was art history because Walker Evans was working with the photographic frame, the frame within the frame. I mean, you could see he was positioning the figures within the white lines of the basketball court within the frame of the picture. So that's Walker Evans. Mm -hmm. Cartier Bresson, I, I don't know if you know, he was part of the resistance in France. Mm -hmm. He was captured, I think, three times. The third wow. time he actually escaped, but his health was impaired. He, it was a ter he had a terrible war, as they say. So he's photographing the six-day race in the Velodrome de Eve in Paris. Now, I don't know if you know what that signifies, but the Velodrome is where they rounded up. It was the biggest roundup of French Jews, mostly women and children. Tens of thousands went off to the camp and never came back. So what I write about, when I write about Cartier-Bresson, they're wonderful bicycle pictures showing all aspects of the race, but he's also photographing ghosts mm -hmm. because very soon after that, they tore the building down because it was the velodrome de sh of shame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the, sports is pretty interesting. And can <laughs> I add that the, the, the text in the book and, and the, the wall text in, in the museum is incredible. I mean, the, something along the lines of what you've been talking about now, but I, I remember the photo, it was uh, of the... Uh, the Pittsburgh, the little leaguers in Pittsburgh, and the commentary that you had, uh, I think Charles Teeny Harris, is that the photographer? Yes. But just the comments and, and this analysis were, were just so insightful. Well, sports does show transformations within society. Uh, this was uh, Teeny Harris, who actually played baseball and had very little education. His pictures define the African-American community in Pittsburgh in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and these young little leader, leaguers, um, the big um, major league players were coming to celebrate the start of their season and they're marching in their brand new uniforms, but they're marching into a new world. They're walking into a new world and the exhibition who shot sports is at the Brooklyn Museum. And I don't have to tell anyone, Brooklyn is where sports became integrated. Can you imagine professional sports without African-American athletes? Was there a, um, like a guiding principle as you were developing this story or, or as you went through and when you excluded some photos and other photos, was there one kind of thread that you tried, tried to stick with as, as you went along? Well, I had to believe in mm -hmm. the photograph. I had to be able to defend the photograph. But the challenge was how do I organize the entire book and exhibition? Because it has to be broken up in some ways. And that was a real challenge until I had this eureka moment where I said, well, how do photographers think? Uh-oh. Because oh. <laughs> I know enough that... You know, they think about... Andrew, you want to say something? <laughs> <laughs> he <No>. will. <laughs> well, I'm not talking about the politics, the, <laughs> right, 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 right. the, the, the hassles. <laughs> I'm talking about things like vantage point. Where do you put your camera? Right. I have a, a, a chapter and a section in the exhibition on, you know, photographers placing their cameras in phenomenal, challenging, exciting ways. I... I did visit Andrew at the Staples Center, and one of the fun experiences was to watch him place his cameras before a game mm -hmm. with duct tape. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Clamps. Very high-tech yeah. yeah. cameras. Yeah. But they were all over the place. Right. And because he 
is so good and so professional, he knows what that camera is going to see, what that angle is. But basically, no one could see from these positions. Mm -hmm. So he's giving the viewer a gift. Yeah. And that's what I mean by how do photographers think. They also think of the decisive moment. We mentioned Cartier-Bresson. Now, the decisive moment in a game is not the same as a photographer's decisive moment. A photographer's decisive moment is when all the elements in the picture come together. Mm -hmm. The mood, the composition, the light, the color, to make for a total picture. I have a section on portraiture because, hello, you know, whether it's a weedy box or, or having... Actually, in my exhibition, I, I did do something that I thought was a lot of fun. I placed baseball cards right next to the Andy Warhol mm -hmm. Polaroids <laughs> yeah, quite intentionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But these are headshots because these are our heroes, and they're different types of portraiture. I have a section behind the scene, and that's where Andy's photograph of uh, Kobe Bryant is because a lot of people can take the action, yeah. but not everybody has the trust or a relationship with an athlete. And it seems to me from my research, more and more photographers lament that ability to have a relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you have two professionals in the room, they do communicate. Whether they're speaking or not, they understand who they are and they're doing a job. Um, so I have behind the scenes. I have one well, the crowds. The, I mean, for me, that was the, the, the. I mean, personally, and because I never had, you know, credentials or access. When I bring my camera to a game, I'm shooting the crowd, the vendors, and mm -hmm. and the, the view that we have. So when when I saw that was included, it was just such a treat. Uh, it had yeah. to be yeah. included mm -hmm. because what sport without the fans? Right. And it's universal. Fans are crazy in the same way all over <laughs> Everywhere. the world. They yeah. are. Irrational in the same way. We'll talk way. about Argentina in a couple minutes, okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. whether, whether, you know, they're sitting on a bench in Africa or sitting in a stadium with tens of thousands of people, uh, it's very important. And really good photographers will turn around and photograph Absolutely. the faces, what they see. So that's what I mean about mm -hmm. organizing it by how yeah. photographers and Thank speaking you. of Argentina, one of the things I loved that it was the what they call the figuritas, which is like the sticker book of Argentine soccer. You had it from from the classic era of Argentina with Maradona, but my kids still go nuts over those. Every four years when the World Cup comes around, all the books get sent up from Argentina, and they get packets of mm -hmm. stickers, and they still put them in like we did with our with our trading cards back mm -hmm. in the day. And the fact that you knew to include that, <laughs> I thought that was pretty impressive. Well, I. I was doing research at FIFA, mm -hmm. and I have to say that was not easy. I, I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, mm -hmm. and FIFA is fabulous in their archives. They said no one had ever looked at the vintage prints mm -hmm. before me. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the first person. I mean, other archives should be kept the way these are, perfect boxes, per perfect archival sheeting. But then the archivist... It's in Switzerland, correct? Is that where the yeah, headquarters are? Yeah, it's in mm -hmm. Zurich. But then the archivist said, did I know about Panini albums? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I said, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he started to tell me that they're probably the most popular collectibles in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And really, we just bought it off eBay mm -hmm. for a few dollars. Wow. It's not a complete one. Yeah. Can you speak a bit uh, about the resources that you that you sought out and, and the archives and the, the places that you went to find these images? Everywhere, mm -hmm. as much as I could do within the amount of time I had. Mm -hmm. Very important going to meet with the photographers, asking them to show me pictures that they love, mm -hmm. maybe that hadn't been published. Um, that's how I... Well, I, it had been published, but when I met Andy, he showed me a number of pictures, and I just fell in love with the Kobe Bryant mm -hmm. because I hadn't seen it before. Mm -hmm. One of the criteria is, as I did my research, I, I learned who maybe innovated something, who did something for the first time, who has a special relationship with an athlete. So a lot of photographs start looking the same, and they're great, but that wasn't what I wanted to put in the book. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, of all mm-hmm. the photos I'm sure you've taken of, of Kobe, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, and of course this is a big year for him, and, mm-hmm. and I've seen through social media the relationship that you've had with him over the years is, mm-hmm. is pretty pretty profound. And for that one to be chosen, I think was pretty great. And also, I just assumed it was a post game, hmm. but you realize he's soaking his ankles and his finger mm-hmm. pre game. Mm-hmm. You know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah that was uh, one of my favorite pictures. Still is um, mm-hmm. maybe top five of my whole career. Wow. Yeah, everything came together like Gail said in that photo, and um, including the access. Mm-hmm. That was amazing. so technically, it was great. Uh, it was a, I wouldn't say it's a lucky moment because as Walter Yost, the great uh, guru of sports photography, says that we make our own luck mm. in our business mm. and um, preparation is the key and relationship is is one of the vehicles to, to get you into that mm-hmm. inner sanctum. We'll, we'll talk more about this after the break, but uh, do, you, do you always go into the locker room and shoot after a game or is that just occasionally or...? I'm always in there before the game. Before the game. And... Sometimes after the game, okay. it depends. It depends. Uh, and this l- latest uh, project I did with Kobe with his um, kind of farewell tour, I was in uh, the training room, which is actually the inner inner, inner sanctum, sanctum right. where it was just Kobe um, greeting people after the game, uh, usually in a cold tank of water <laughs> <laughs> with a towel around him, <laughs> and uh, everyone from celebrities to coaches to other players mm-hmm. coming in to pay homage to him because That's it was funny. the last time they would play against him. Right. So right. I was in there to record that. Now, you I mentioned bet. you were always in there before the game, but mm-hmm. not always after. Why? Right. Um, before, I love to get the preparation. Okay. I, I just love, I love, first of all, I have great relationships with the, the trainers in L.A. that I've worked with for years mm-hmm. and years and years. Um, Jason Powell with the Clippers, a good friend, and Gary Vitti, a former Laker trainer, just retired. retired. 31 years we've worked together. So um, I just, sometimes I go in without a camera and we just, you know, shoot the breeze for a while. And the players get accustomed to seeing me in there, the coaches. um, You become part of the wallpaper. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 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 In the book itself is it an amazing timeline where you go through from the 1800s when photography started and sports photography started. You tie in the growth of photography with events in sports and it's some wonderful things. You talk about specific photographs and the techniques that we used. And it's a great way of following the development of the technology of photography in relationship to sports. All right. Well, thank you for uh, acknowledging that. I didn't write it because I actually... Um, Nigel Russell is a world expert on cameras, films, mm-hmm. We're going lenses. to have Nigel on the show in a couple mm. weeks. And, <laughs> That's too much. And <laughs> this was actually a nice challenge for him because he knows so much, but he hadn't actually thought about, well, what was... It's a different context. Yes, yeah. which cameras were really used, you know, and so many of the prototypes are developed for the Olympics yeah. so that when it wasn't even on the market, you had sports photographers trying something out. But what I discovered, and I think I'm correct on this, is that as a group, sports photography, sports photographers have pushed camera technology more than any other group. They had to stop the action. Mm-hmm. And with when photography was invented, You couldn't even take pictures of people. It was too slow. So moving right along, sports photographers needed faster cameras, longer lenses, more sensitive material. More frames per second. Or even a frame per second. (laughs) Strobe, Strobe, sync, strobe, strobe, flash. I mean, photographers would talk about following focus and then autofocus. I would interview photographers who would develop 35 millimeter film in the back of a car mm-hmm. as they raced to the newspaper so that the wet negatives could be printed for the evening newspaper. You haven't lived until you've done that, mm-hmm. by the way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's <laughs> Drying them, holding them out, or <laughs> developing in toilets or wherever. Um, <laughs> wire services. There's... The story of sports photography is a very, very good way to understand the evolution, the technical evolution of photography. Yeah, can you speak at all about uh, maybe some some pioneer women photographers who we we don't know of, and also women that were included in the in the show? 
Is that a tough well, question? Yeah. <laughs> in Maybe. A, it, it is because it's a, a boys club. Yeah. It, mm. it has been and it probably still is. Um, I One answer is that some of the really best extreme sports photographers today are women. Right. They don't have to deal with people edging them out. They don't have to deal with locker rooms. They're mm. fearless. They jump out of airplanes. They disappear in the wilderness for six months and come back with great photographs. Tony Frizzell um, shot for Sports Illustrated. She is better known as a fashion photographer, but she came from a very upper class background. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to shoot for Sports Illustrated. And a lot of the Sports Illustrated photographers in the early years, in the 1950s, they were sons of immigrants. They didn't know one end of a horse from another, mm -hmm. let alone go to a polo game. Right. They couldn't photograph skiing in the Alps because they had never been on skis. Mm. They couldn't photograph Newport boating, you know, sailing, because they really didn't know anything about it. So she was assigned all these, you know, great... Um, Blue upper mud. class yeah. sports, but she she was good. But um, Robert Rieger, uh, the great sports photographer, he was an illustrator at Sports Illustrated before he really started using a camera. In 1967, he did a huge exhibition called Man in Sport, and it was huge. I think he really wanted it to be a follow up to uh, family of man? the family of man mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was that, how mm. could I, that was the most important mm. biggest exhibition and mm. book moment ever had the family of man it so he it was huge uh, hundreds and hundreds of photographs only two women photographers mm. one was tony frizzell who actually had a good representation of her work and there was another photographer whose name I forgot, and she had two. Mm -hmm. The rest, and there were scores of photographers, were all male. Um, at the opening of my exhibition, it was a kind of reunion. Uh -huh. You had Heinz Klutmeier and Walter Yost and uh, a lot of the big name mm. sports photographers from Sports Illustrated, from All Sport. And I asked them a little bit about women sports photographers. Basically, they all were talking about how difficult they made it mm. for women. Um, I wish there were more women. Mm. There will be. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take a short break and come back with Andrew. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. We are back. Okay, Andrew, I have a question. I have a couple of questions for you, actually. Um, I, I wanted to talk about how you got into sporting photography. Was it photography or was it sports that came first? And um, I want to follow that up with... Uh, a couple of questions about technology. Now, mm -hmm. you've been at this for a while, so you remember mm -hmm. shooting film. Mm -hmm. um, and now Four-letter word. Film, <laughs> that's letter. right. That's <laughs> correct. Yeah. Um, and now, obviously, you're, you're, you're completely electronic and digital. And I'm really curious about something. We now have the ability to remotely fire cameras at, at 10 plus frames per second. Uh, we can position them. We could remotely control. We have an amazing amount of control of what we can do. And if you miss a shot, it's it's your fault at this point in time. Going back a couple of decades to get that amazing shot, it was pure skill, intuition, and just knowing exactly when to press that button. Are we getting better pictures today? Is it easy to be a photographer today, or is it more challenging to be a photographer because we've lost all of these skills. I think we have. Anyway. No, that's a loaded question, Alan. But, um, basically... In, any, in 20 words or less. Anybody <laughs> anybody can be a photographer because of the technology we all have in our pocket. Yeah. Um, with, with the iPhone and um, camera phone. It, it's, it's wonderful. And it's wonderful for me as a professional photographer to know that my eight-year-old daughter 
has the ability to take a, a photograph and feel good about it. And she actually won a contest in the second grade because she took a, a cool photograph with her iPhone camera. Um, I don't know if we're getting better pictures today. Um, I think that uh, the profession um, stays the, pretty much the way it's always been. There is a hierarchy of professional photographers who do it for a living, who create images rather than just snap images. You know, I, I, I go crazy when somebody says, oh, that's a great snapshot you took. You know, Ooh. It's, it's not a snapshot, you know. Um, <laughs> we all winced in the studio I, when that I, came out. If I took it with my iPhone, it would be a snapshot. If it took me six hours to set it up and prepare and uh, and create it, um, uh, it's not. It's it's actually what I do for a living, yeah. you know. But going back to your first question about did, did sports or photography come first? Um, I had to think about that for a second, but I think sports came first. I grew up in Brooklyn and um, played every imaginable sport from street hockey to, you know, stickball and I was just basketball, say basketball and everything. Stickball, um, sure. We played tackle football in my elementary school schoolyard that didn't have any grass. It was, you know, cement in the mm -hmm. winter. In the winter. Right? But yeah. I was always the <laughs> smallest guy and I was always picked last, you know. And But I love sports. I love to play them. And my, my biggest connection with my father was through sports. My dad was a diehard Brooklyn Dodger fan and I was born the year that the Dodgers moved in 58. And um, He didn't blame you for that, did he? No, they, actually, my, <laughs> my dad and my uncles wore a black armband for a year. No, it's a true story. If you see photos of our family, they're wearing a black armband. And I thought, you know, I thought growing up that they were mourning that I was born. You know? <laughs> but it was actually because the Dodgers left. <laughs> so, um, so I became a Mets fan because I could not utter the word, much less even think in my consciousness the word Yankee in my house because they hated them. Because they always beat the Dodgers, of course. Um, I became a Mets fan, and then the but Indians, we, by the way. But, yeah, Sorry, but we but. connected. My dad and I connected over the Rangers. My my grandfather and then my dad had season tickets for the to the Rangers uh, at the old Garden and then the new Garden. And I went to almost every Ranger game from maybe uh, nine years old until I left for college at really? seventeen with my dad. So that was our connection. So when I started to discover photography when I was about fourteen. It was because my dad gave me a camera, actually. Um, Do you remember the camera? Yes, it was a Canon TL. Oh, yeah. And there's a very... I'm going I'm to tell a story, and it's going to be a little long, but I'll tell it anyway. Mm -hmm. My dad buys me this camera right before he and I are going to go on a trip to, out west to all the national parks. And in those days, as you remember, um, Kodachrome came in, with a mailer. Right? Yeah. It had a bright yellow mailer. Mm -hmm. So you would take... Take the film wherever you were. It was prepaid. Put it in the mailer. Put it in a in a uh, mailbox anywhere in the upload country. It to, upload it to the mailbox. Yeah, right. <laughs> Drop it in the mailbox, <laughs> and then lo and behold, in your mailbox at home, weeks later would come a yellow box with slides in it. Right. So my dad was was a clinical psychologist by trade, but thought of himself as a amateur photographer. You know that he was this great photographer, and he's going to teach his son, you know, everything about photography. So he buys me this camera. It's going to be like a bonding thing on our trip. And, <laughs> and we go out there, and he's got his mailers, and I have my mailers, and we're dropping them in, you know, Yosemite and in Yellowstone and, you know, these podunk towns in the middle of nowhere thinking we'll never see the film again because <laughs> it's going in some <laughs> random mailbox. And we come <laughs> – this is a true story. We come home from the trip, and there are, like, hundreds of yellow boxes, <laughs> right, and, <laughs> in – you know, in giant boxes at our house, and my mother didn't know what to do with it. And we start opening the boxes, and my dad is like, "Oh, this is an incredible picture of of Old Faithful, and look at this one of Mount Rainier, and and this one of Yosemite, or whatever." And and I said, "Dad, um, you know, that's one whole role, right?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, "But but you're in those pictures." <laughs> 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 and he said, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well." I took those. That's my role to film. <laughs> so I realized right then that 
and he did begrudgingly uh, <laughs> that I actually had a talent and an eye and and he never spoke to you again he never <laughs> spoke to me again no. <laughs> but but I in high school I took it up and I had a very good friend who had a dark room in his basement and uh, he was so generous to let me to teach me photography and my big high school uh, Midwood High School in Brooklyn had a um, monthly newspaper and a yearbook I became the editor of both of those and then when I went to the University of Massachusetts um, which did not have a bona fide photography department. They didn't even have a class in photography, but we had a very prestigious uh, daily newspaper that was the actual newspaper that the town would get before mm-hmm. any other hmm. um, Amherst, real newspaper. Amherst? Amherst, yeah. Okay. Boston Globe was an evening, uh, an afternoon paper in western Massachusetts. So we, I covered everything, like Gail was talking about. I covered everything from Jimmy Carter's um, presidential campaign to dance concerts to sports to dorm life. I started working for the uh, fraternities and sororities and all that stuff. But and I every really, day was a new challenge. And it was great. You had, something, you had to learn every day. Yeah, and like three weeks, three weeks into my freshman year, I became the assistant photo editor because they saw that, you know, I was there all the time. So I, I really enjoyed it, but I gravitated towards sports and I – I realized that uh, I needed to get some sports. I, I needed to get some real technical photography training, which I wasn't getting at uh, UMass. So I transferred to Art Center College of Design in in Pasadena, California, and um, met a bunch of Sports Illustrated photographers through my teachers there, and that was really was where that it took school off. known for mm-hmm. sports photography training or photography at, in general? It was it. <laughs> Art Center was and still is a. Uh, a hardcore commercial advertising right. institution, uh, um, where I was, I was the black sheep uh, of my class. I was told I would never make it. Uh, I went in for my my senior review. It was eight eight semesters, and you go in before your eight eighth term to the chairman of the department, who was a contemporary of Ansel Adams, and founded the photography department, art center. And he looked at me. He says, he "says kid, nobody makes money doing what what you want to do." And I said, well, have you heard of John Zimmerman or Neil Leifer? And he goes, well, there may be an exception or two. And have you seen Sports Illustrated? <laughs> you know, But the, they trained us to be commercial photographers, to open a studio, to work in fashion, do you know, huge car productions and things like that. So I wanted, you know, I, I'm a Brooklyn kid. I wanted to prove everybody wrong. Mm-hmm. God bless you. And I had two teachers, <laughs> two teachers that were – incredibly supportive and mentors and, and are to this day 40 years later. Um, Bill Robbins was one of my teachers that got me, um, got my foot in the door with Sports Illustrated. And Jim Cacabo, who was a Vietnam veteran photographer, he actually was a combat photographer, who lost 53 friends in Vietnam, fellow, fellow um, news photographers. And Jim, still a dear friend, uh, but they believed in me and they pushed me and I... I I never looked back. I, I decided that's what I wanted to do. Was there a hmm. was there a, a big break? Was there the first big job or the first photo that uh, that sent you skyward? Or well, that's a great question, John. Because there actually was I <laughs> I, um, I was shooting everything and anything, any sport, just to build up my portfolio. Stuff I never even heard of. I mean, mm-hmm. who knew from rugby? You know, right. growing up in Brooklyn, right. <laughs> and uh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and in those days, you could just walk in. I could walk into UCLA or Pepperdine and with a camera or USC or wherever and and just plop myself down and shoot. So I was shooting, you know, water polo and rhythmic gymnastics. And, and there was a, a great um, pre-Olympic tournament, which I don't think they have anymore, but it, it was held by the um, U.S. Olympic Committee in Colorado Springs called the National Sports Festival – where every sport that was going, that the U.S. teams were going to participate in was showcased. So I went out to that, and my dad at the time was living in Colorado Springs, so it was perfect. And I spent five or six days just shooting one sport after the other, building up my portfolio. And I got a call from from the uh, public relations director of the um, the North American Soccer League team, long defunct team that the Cosmos were part of, mm-hmm. uh, that Pele paid mm-hmm. for. In Los Angeles, uh, the team was called the Aztecs. And uh, they're looking for a photographer. They were going to pay like $35 a game or some right. unknown like, right. crazy amount. And would I be interested? And I, I lived in Pasadena. They played at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena at night. And 
Um, I was still, I was finishing up school, so I was still in school during the days. So it kind of worked out. I built a dark room in my garage, you know, like Gail was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I went in for the interview, and um, they started asking me questions about soccer. Now, I didn't know anything about soccer. I'd never see, really seen soccer. I, you know, didn't play it. We didn't grow up with it. But I was a huge hockey fan. Right. So I'm figuring it's like hockey, yeah. you know, but it's on grass. Yeah. It's bigger. Right. And, you know, <laughs> 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 and, and, and I, I just... And you hit the puck with your head. Pretty yeah. much. Yeah. And I, I winged it, and I, I owned one camera. I didn't even have a long lens, which you need for soccer. Right. So they hired me, and uh, that was my first real break. And uh, my second really big break was when the Dodgers hired me in 1984, mm -hmm. and I was their team photographer for 11 years. So the last time they won the World Series, which was 88, was I was working for them, mm -hmm. so they obviously missed me terribly. <laughs> 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 and then, of course, I was in the right place at the right time for the um, resurgence of the NBA, the explosion of during the Magic Bird era, mm -hmm. Showtime, and... Uh, really just kind of built my my reputation up through that Showtime era. And Pat Riley was a great supporter of mine, so I, you know, have a lot to thank him for. Is there a difference between a successful photograph in general and a successful sporting photograph? Well, Gail spoke very eloquently about it, that the decisive moment is what it is. And I was very much into photojournalism and the, and the greats of photojournalism and prided myself on always trying to be, I always said you have to have a little bit of ESP in what I do, like you have to be like a millisecond ahead of what, mm -hmm. be able to mm -hmm. anticipate. And that's come, that comes from experience, but also from knowledge of the sport. Right. Or knowledge of that particular player. You know, Magic would come down the court and he'd do 15 moves before the the ball ended up either in somebody's hand or he went to the basket. Now, keep in mind, I I shoot with a strobe system in the arena, which allows me to shoot one picture every four seconds. So I can't be motor driving Magic coming down the court. I have to wait for the the decisive moment, the the peak action. Now, of course, I'd miss it a lot because you just guess wrong or arm in the face or a referee gets in the way or whatever, or you, God forbid, out of focus. Um, but um, I think more than anything, a great photograph, like any photograph, it could be a landscape, it could be a portrait, it could be a war photograph, um, it could be a picture of a baby, um, it could be a sports photograph, it has to elicit a response, an emotion from the viewer. And I think sports helps that because it's dramatic to begin with. And like Gail said, the, um, the celebration of the human form and what the human body can do. I mean, I'm still fascinated thousands of games into my NBA career, what these athletes can do with their bodies. It's just mind blowing to me. I have a daughter that's a dancer and I see the, the parallel between what she does and what these guys do. And it's, you know, completely different disciplines, but, um, it, it's amazing to me. Can you speak a bit about your about your setup, your gear? What you I know from what I've read anyway, you carry two ca two, two cameras, mm. two lenses around your neck, mm. and you have several set up around the uh, arena. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to uh, the specifics of that? Well, I'll run you through a timeline. Mm -hmm. um, our sure. our game, let's say, a game is at seven thirty, and um, my assistant arrives about uh, three o'clock, three thirty. And we uh, are lucky enough at Staples Center that everything's in one place. So the team, the, the teams I work for are housed in Staples Center, Lakers, Clippers, and Kings, and the Sparks during the summertime, um, the WNB team. So we're lucky enough to be able to keep all our equipment in a cage there that things don't have to be packed and unpacked like when we go on the road. But, so he gets there and lays everything out, and basically we do a setup of seven to nine remote cameras every game. Mm -hmm. So the cameras are, have to be placed um, in, st in strategic spots around the arena, everywhere from um, on the stanchion, through the backboard, above the backboard, in the floor. I actually invented a position that where we cut out a part, a piece of the, the stanchion pad, and we actually placed the camera in the f basically in the floor. Um, on railings around the arena and overhead position in the catwalk looking straight down. In the old days, we used to actually have human remotes. <laughs> I had literally had assistants who would sit with cameras 
and they would f- they would focus because this was the pre autofocus and and I would fire them through this remote control system that we have, and then I I come in around f- usually around four thirty or five, and luckily my office is, is in Staples Center, so I can usually be in the office before I come down for a game. And the rough setup is already being done. We have an intern usually that helps us every game as well. And we set up my where where I am, which is on my spot at a basketball game, is on the opposite side to where our remotes are set up. And my position has um, two handheld cameras and two more cameras that I walk around with. And so it's basically could be an 11 camera setup, 11, 12 camera setup for any game. Do you leave any of these game. cameras set up all the time where there's everything taken down completely? I mean, I mentioned some of these locations could be kind of hard to re- get to. The only location we keep a camera up all season long is our overhead, our straight down catwalk position. Okay. And every camera and lens is paired with a, uh, a brain, a transceiver, and that receives a signal from the main brain which I trigger with a auxiliary trigger button, and it's all done by radio. In the old days, they, it had to be wired, so we would be actually wiring a camera with a, a wire that flew down from the catwalk to the basket and ran all the way around the court to me with a plunger button. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's we, we helped to develop a system about 20 years ago with a company in Vermont that uh, developed this flash wizard system that's all done by radio. Mm-hmm. But all the other cameras are have to be removed and what, packed uh, up. What what brand? What camera do you use? It's all Nikon. All Nikon. And I started with Canon at the beginning of my career, and unfortunately, um, Canon um, didn't have a high enough uh, sync sh- uh, shutter speed mm-hmm. that could stop the action with flash. They had a ninetieth of a second, right. and then they went up to one hundred twenty fifth of a second. But we were still it was wasn't fully um, stopping the action. You get a lot of motion and ghosting. And all of a sudden, here comes Nikon with a 250th sync, mm-hmm. which was the, uh, I think it was the FM2 or FE2. Yeah, FM2. Yep. And um, so I moved over to Nikon. I've been with them ever since. What lenses do you, are they all different lenses or mm-hmm. everything? Yeah, in the old days, we used to use prime lenses. Uh, and that's before um, zoom lenses became so useful and, cool. and, and now we're using all zoom lenses. But my overhead is, is an 80 to 400 probably at about 300 millimeter. My camera through the, the glass of the backboard is essentially about a 20. The one at the base on the floor is uh, at an 18. Um, ones on the railings are 70 to 200s. My handheld is, I use 28 to 300 in one of my handhelds, oh, yeah. and the other is a 200 to 400 on a monopod. And then my walking around camera is, uh, has a, usually a 16 to 35 and a fisheye. Oh, I'm kind of covered with all that stuff. And the, and the fisheye, you find yourself, is that for action underneath the, the net? No, I love the fisheye for my pregame ritual, okay. like um, when the captains meet before the game and I'm in the circle with the referees okay. or um, coaches holding his his pregame chat with the players before they, you know, mm-hmm. they do tip off mm-hmm. um, or a wide shot of the arena or sometimes it's fun to shoot fans with the fisheye. Um, I bring it into the locker room sometimes. And you have an assistant that follows you around just for handing off cameras and gear, or are you just on your own? No, I'm on my own once the game starts. My assistant, Adam Pantosi, who Mm -hmm. you know really well, who I stole from New York, (laughs) um, is my number one guy, and he's the guy in charge of the setup. And he's in charge of also making sure that that the cameras are, are working. We have a tethering system now that our cameras are actually tethered through a network back to NBA Photos in New Jersey. So as I'm shooting and as these remote cameras are shooting, they're transmitting the photos directly back to New Jersey in real time. Mm-hmm. And we like to call it live coverage because it really is. And uh, an editor at NBA Photos in New Jersey is receiving the photos, is selecting the ones that will eventually get captioned and sent up to Getty. Does or, it bother you that you're not seeing all the stuff coming out and you're not doing all the editing and selecting and stuff like that? I mean, No, I, I trust these guys, and especially trust Adam and, and uh, whoever's editing for me on site because they really know what they're looking for. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I totally trust and them. And can you monitor the cameras? Do you monitor <clears throat> what's going on or do you just know what you're doing and well, everything else? Yeah, do you, do you chimp yeah. along the way? I, I do chimp. <laughs> It's it's hard to, it's hard to chimp, actually, because, you know, the action is going on. Right. And, and it, because it's in real time, 
you can't chimp and delete. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I didn't, so, I realize it. yeah. It's but like, sometimes I want to see, oh, did I get that one? That yeah. kind of thing. Um, but uh, Adam Adam monitors what's going back to NBA photos through the feed, so, so he can see if if something's not working. If there's right. a problem, you yeah, find exactly. out. Real and we, fast. Uh, yeah, and if, you know sometimes the cameras aren't syncing, not yep. getting strobe, or um, a camera that's p- placed under the under the stanchion gets kicked a lot. Yeah. So he has to come out and readjust it and things like that. Do you ever, do you ever have any? Because uh, you do a lot of stuff with remotes. Do you ever have problems where somebody else in that arena is firing off your gear and you're just no, you're losing it? Absolutely. Um, my handheld cameras, the ones I usually walk around with, uh, are triggered by the strobes are triggered by Pocket Wizard. Right. So before um, they invented uh, custom channels, Pocket Wizard only had I think four channels. Yes. Or maybe eight or something. It was, whatever. It was four. Four, yeah, four channels. Four channels. So. We used to have the X Games for years at Staples Center, and um, I used to shoot it, and my assistants used to shoot the X Games with strobe, and all of a sudden we see the strobes going off. And it turned out that some people would bring pocket wizards in and just kind of scan the channels until they hit the channel that fired our strobe system. (laughs) And it happened more than once. It probably happened half a dozen times. And is the Staples Center... Are you guys kind of far and away advanced in terms of your setup compared to other arenas, or is that kind of standard, the, the, what you described? Uh, I'd say about half the photographers in the NBA do as, as almost as big or as big a setup as I do every mm-hmm. game. Okay. Um, some photographers don't. Right. You know, they, some photographers don't shoot with any remotes, but um, this has been my kind of way of doing business. I have to repeat that sports photographers have really pushed camera technology. Yeah. They've either innovated themselves or they found somebody to work with. Mm -hmm. And as Andy said, his daughter's a dancer. Well, you'd think dance photographers also are faced with bodies moving, Mm -hmm. but they haven't pushed the technology the way... They're not getting paid yeah. as much either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, usually. Well, the technology... And they don't have the outlet. That is yeah. probably yeah. a case in point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the reasons the technology, we pushed it to the limit is that um, <laughs> during the Jordan era, when Michael would have this iconic dunk, mm-hmm. um, we would get maybe we'd get one shot at it, and that would be one picture of that moment that could be sold to one entity for use. Mm-hmm. So when this company, LPA, out of Vermont approached us about trying to develop a a multi-camera system that could fire on one single strobe burst, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. Once there's just one light? One strobe? One strobe goes off. Where it's in the center above? In Staples Center, um, we have three separate sets of strobes, and each set of strobes consists of eight packs, 2,400 packs, and Speedatron heads. So when I push my shutter button, these eight packs and heads go off, like one gigantic flash that's on your camera. But you can only shoot once every four seconds mm-hmm. because it'd have to recycle right. back up. And before this technology, you would get one image, right? So um, we thought, wow, wouldn't it be great to get Michael Jordan's dunk from five or six angles that could be sold to five or six entities? Oh. Um and it, you're not selling the same photograph. You're selling the same moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it really was very self-serving. Capitalism you know? <laughs> at, its, at its heart right there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it took a lot of R&D and a lot of frustration, and we couldn't get this thing to work. And this is back in the film days where I was using Hasselblads to shoot game <laughs> oh, action. Oh. It was a leaf shutter, and it, you know, it was a big lag in the shutter, and it wasn't syncing with the strobes and... One camera would have a different lag than the other one, and it just was a nightmare. Mm. Can you speak to this then? I mean, it's, you're like on the front lines of, of of the digital tech. Has it changed everything, mm. uh, the way you work and the way you th- even the way you think, or, well, or not so much? I don't know. I, I, I got to say I'm very old school, and I miss the film days. Mm-hmm. I miss the, seeing that piece of film, and um, especially the two and a quarter, which was beautiful. And I was dragged kicking and screaming into the digital era. I mean, I still, I still, uh, you know, I have to do it. Um, but the the days of film and manual focus and manual exposure and all that stuff, you know, that is the true kind of um, roots of photography for me. Did you know, you, I, it's, it, 
aside from the fact that you happen to like the aesthetics of film, are you getting more successful photographs now based on your skill set, knowing how you've evolved and you understand the game, the equipment, and everything else? Are you still staying ahead of it? I got to tell you, it's, it's kind of taken the f a little bit of the fun out of it because, you know, when you had to manually focus and, and try to get a guy dunking and get one frame at it and you're shooting with a Hasselblad. And, um, if it came out, that's because yeah. you did everything right. Right. And I, I'm not yeah. saying that it's easier now. It just, I don't know, it's not as challenging. How does your work different than, let's say, your uh, standard beat photographer or newspaper photographer? Mm -hmm. Is there a, Can you draw an easy distinction between what you're doing and what they're doing? Well, I have to do what they're doing and 20 other things because <laughs> a news photographer who I, I respect some of my best friends are longtime news photographers. They're they're there to record a, a moment or or something having to do with the story of the game, mm -hmm. which I'm there to do also um, for the NBA. But I'm still working for the Lakers, right. so that the Lakers are going to need isolated shots of this player, or that player, or I have to shoot the coach, or I have to shoot the fans, or or there's uh, stuff going on for the marketing department. Um, there's like 900 things right. going on at a game. And I've been able to kind of delegate some of that to kind of free me up. But um, I have to have a very wide vision of what's going on. And when I go to an NBA Finals game, for example, it's not just what's going on in front of me, but it's, it's everything else. Uh, from How many people do you have on, on an average game working on your team? And there's four of us, uh, usually, three or four. And, and you're uh, all shooting. No, um, only only myself. Is shooting. Okay. So I have my main assistant, and then I have uh, an intern, who's kind of a second set of hands for my assistant. And sometimes we have a digital tech. Um, so sometimes there's two of us at a given Laker game, a Clipper game. Um, when we get to the NBA All Star game or the finals, then it's a big crew. And it's uh, I would say all told, it's probably twenty five. Uh, Photographers, text assistants, of which I think five of us are, the, are photographers. Two so of us. So a lot on the of court. it is just support and making sure everything is working the way it should be working. Right, and some some photographers have certain assignments, like at the finals, for example, they're only shooting the commissioner. You know, okay. some photographers assigned to the commissioner and all his right. VIP guests. Another photographer is assigned to everything happening in the periphery, from fans to concession stands to exteriors to all that stuff. Um, it's myself and, and my cohort, Nat Butler, uh, on the court. And then uh, we usually have two, sometimes three photographers from elevated positions. Mm -hmm. And five of us are actually covering the game. And so at that point, you're working for the NBA. Yes. And let's say the Lakers are in the finals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who are, you, who are you working for? Well, I, I'm working for the NBA. Um, the Lakers have access to everything I shoot mm -hmm. through the NBA and through the NBA's um, agreement with Getty. Mm -hmm. Um but I ha also have to have my staff who's taking care of the Laker needs mm -hmm. as well. Right. So the Lakers will have sponsorship and marketing things going on. So I have to have photographers assigned to that. Ownership might need a photographer for guests they're entertaining. So it's it's a it's a production. Yeah. Is it safe to assume that these images belong to the NBA? It is very safe to assume. That. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> what, yes. about, what about can speak to that. Does your does your name Kills appear on the photograph yes. in credits? Yeah. My for my NBA pictures that are published um my it's my name slash nbae NBA. which is nba entertainment okay. slash okay. getty images so getty and the nba have a licensing deal together mm -hmm. and um luckily i get my name for them and you, too. you feed the beast <laughs> and get a, and get a byline yep okay. yeah the, the old days of, of owning your copyright are over you're in a high pressure position where you have to get the winner oh, every yeah. single time. Well, the problem that we have as sports photographers, not just in basketball but across the board, is that TV is broadcasting the game with 15, 25 cameras mm -hmm. from every possible angle. So my boss is watching it back in New Jersey. Yeah. And if he doesn't see that Kobe Bryant dunk or that incredible move or last-second shot, if I didn't get that, he, you know, mm. he, he knows within two seconds. Well, that is one of the challenges, and, and back to the de decisive moment, is you may have an incredible decisive moment, but it you know, it could have been a, a second-quarter pass mm -hmm. as opposed to the game-winning shot. And 
no one's going to care about that decisive moment if it's not the winner, at least not I, I for did. the paper. Gail does. Gail does. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Thank you. I think Gail could care There's less. Only a book every so often. <laughs> she could care less. In fact, if you go to the exhibition, I don't think that you see one picture of a guy holding a championship trophy or, right, right? or right. whatever. Hmm. Um, that was not what you were looking for. Ski you were looking and for the, the moment and how artful it is. Well, I, I had issues with particular photographers because they were so proud of an incredible sports photograph that they took. Um, Barton Silverman really wanted me to exhibit and to reproduce his Joe Namath jumping up to throw the pass. Mm -hmm. You know, Joe never jumps up to throw a pass. Right. Do you know how important <laughs> this photograph is? Right, right. I said, well, no, I don't, but I like other photographs better. Mm. He said, but they're not as important in in photography and in sports history. Sports, and yeah. I like the one of Joe Bullside, though. You know, I love that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and Walter Yost said, "Could you imagine Tom Brady doing that?" I remember, today? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, what what photos are, are of yours are most recognized, most well known, and and what are you most proud of? Are there any photos you can speak of? Well, I've been lucky to have been to some really amazing events. I mean, I, I was there when Kirk Gibson hit the home run, mm -hmm. the home run, mm -hmm. probably the greatest home run in the mm -hmm. history of baseball. So I was able to record that and get a photo of that. Um, um, Michael Jordan's first championship, for example, where he's hugging the trophy and crying yeah. with his dad his next dad right to him there, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. in 1991. And, um, <clears throat> and Magic and Bird intertwined. And uh, that was the 87 finals, I believe. Um, moments with Kobe, for example, um, just, you know, when he just retired this past April, walking off the court for the last time and waving goodbye. Um, you know, I photographed all of Shaq's career. So I've been, you know, lucky to have mm -hmm. been to some great events, mm -hmm. um, covered every Olympic team since 1992, including the Dream Team. Right. So uh, there might be a few out there that people remember. Oh, for sure. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> I know I do. But any, any maybe any one obscure photo that uh, people haven't seen that you're just proud of because you caught the moment or for an artistic composition or anything off the top of your head? Well, there's not one specific photograph, but there are sports that I shot that that I wish I still shot, I still did, because I used to love shooting tennis. Mm -hmm. uh, loved it. I always I always said at the beginning of my career, if I could become a, a tennis tour photographer, it would be the greatest career ever because you could travel all over the place, you're shooting tennis. Um, I love shooting boxing. Boxing mm -hmm. was... Tremendous. I, I, in fact, I did. I was Oscar De La Hoya's first official photographer yeah, yeah. when he broke in uh, professionally in '92, and that's only because the Dream Team guys during the '92 Olympics used to go watch boxing on the off night. So players like Karl Malone and uh, Drexler and those guys became friends with Oscar, mm -hmm. and so I, I used to tag along. And I met Oscar, and you know, in a pro, um, he said, "Yeah, why not? Be my my official guy." So it's uh, it's been a good ride. But I, I just have to talk about the exhibition in the book because it, it's so unbelievably uh, gratifying, humbling. I don't even know what the, the words are to express how I feel about being in an exhibition with with the godfathers of sports photography, and. And these icons of, of media that I didn't even know were sports photographers. I mean, I'm in an exhibition with Stanley Kubrick, really. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> and, and Neil Eifer and, and Walter and all these guys that paved the way. And to go back to Brooklyn where I came from, and it's just such an amazing mm -hmm. full circle yeah, right. experience. Yeah. Well, I, hmm. I, could, I, I would not have done the show without you. Yeah. I, well. Andrew was um, so generous, not just with his own photographs but really teaching me because I had a lot to learn and he invited me to the Staples Center. He showed me how he worked and he also, not every sports photographer is easy, mm -hmm. but for the most part, they're, they're not like the rock and roll photographers mm -hmm. uh, and they respect each other. Um, and that's what was really gratifying and even Walter Yost, who is considerably older than Andy, and I had so many emails from him thanking me mm -hmm. and telling me how much he learned. Mm. He kept mm -hmm. on saying, 
I learned so much from this book. So that <laughs> is really gratifying. Yeah. Because I didn't think I could teach anybody anything. Yeah, um, it's yeah. Well, we're a very small community, really, of uh, professional sports photographers, and we've been uh, kind of the poor stepchild or poor third cousin <laughs> to even photojournalists, news sure. photographers, and and for Gail to to take this incredible risk, I guess, uh, to try to elevate us as as photographers who belong in the same conversation with some of the great photographers. Yeah. Gail, okay. um, so the show is on at Brooklyn Museum until? January 8th, 2017. Okay, so we have a few more months to go. And I, I'm, I'm going to repeat it again. I know I said it early on. The uh, I did not see the show yet, but I know, according to John, that the book and the show are very closely uh, related as mm -hmm. far as content, and the book just blew me away. Again, I'm not a sports person. But I find it as a photographic document, uh, as a piece of information, and as source of inspiration. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. You did a great job. Thank you. You really did. Thank it's you. just nice. And I got to catch the show. Before Where can we find the book? Local bookstores, museum shops, and online. And of course, at at the bookstore at at the Brooklyn Museum. Mm -hmm. Correct. So, uh, yes. With signed yes. copies by signed Gail. Signed copies. So. And Journey to the Ring is available, I'm sure, if yeah, you can, online. You can yeah. still get it online, okay. uh, journeytothering.com or through uh, an online service that we all know. Right. And um, not too many copies of that went around, but they actually are selling the book at the, Bro at the Brooklyn Museum, yes, which, which okay. I was shocked when Great. I saw it. That was wonderful. Yeah. I sh they should have had you sign them. Yeah. They should have. Yeah, I, I was... Uh, I'm, was flabbergasted when I saw it. There was wonderful. Do you keep a uh, an Instagram account or anything? I do. There? I have an Instagram account. Um, it's it's ADB Photo Inc. Okay. And uh, I post photos from my career, um, milestones or whatever. If we're approaching something like this week, for example, Shaq and Yao Ming or and Alan Iverson are going into the Hall of Fame. So I'll start posting some vintage photos that I oh, shot of good. them. Okay. And uh, I would love, you know, people to follow me. It would be great. And Gail, do you want to Gail Buckland? Dot com. Dot com. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Gail. Thank you, Andrew. It's a really wonderful, wonderful discussion yeah, today. Fun. And uh, thank you to our listeners for tuning in. And remember, uh, give us a rating on iTunes. Let us know what you think because what you think is what we want to do. So, uh, as usual, thank you all very much for tuning in today. <laughs>